Hello, I'm Dickie Arbiter in London. And I'm Victoria Arbiter in New York, and you're watching Royal Report. hundred years, there have, on occasion, been suggestions that royal women are little more than compliant brood mares who happen to look nice in a pretty dress. But the House of Windsor has been well served by the women within its ranks. Devoted to crown and country, each has an inner steeliness that has contributed to their success. Dad, I'm going to get to the current ladies holding down the fort in just a moment, but I'd like to start with the Queen Mother. She was frequently portrayed as the nation's favourite twinkly-eyed granny, but I'd go so far as to suggest that her influence over her grandson, then Prince Charles, is the reason why he has so much admiration for the women in his sphere. So we're going to talk about the women in his sphere in today's episode, but going to the Queen Mother, what was she like behind the scenes? She was as tough as nails. Um, <laughs> You you could get through her. You you couldn't flannel with her. And when I say flannel, you had to be perfectly straight, perfectly honest. You had to look her in the eye when you spoke to her and don't try and bluff her because she'd been there before. She'd been on the royal scene since since 1923. So she knew all about it. She knew all the tricks of the trade. Queen Elizabeth, as she was then during the uh, Second World War, was very much the guiding light for her husband, King George VI. Uh, she was tough, uh, and her toughness rebounded on him. I never, I wasn't there, but she is famously quoted as saying, after Buckingham Palace had been bombed and the East End of London had been flattened, now I can look East Enders in the face, because she'd experienced firsthand what bombing was like. She was very tough. She was very soft as well. She was very flowery in the way she, she dressed. I remember on one occasion, um, she was going to lay a foundation stone at London's new Queen Mary Hospital. Uh, and I'm, I'm going back to the 1980s now. And I remember going there. I was a reporter. Uh, and I said to the PR man, where's she going to speak from? Oh, no, she's not going to speak. I said, she is going to speak. Try and stop her. No, 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 no. Of course she's not going to speak. I said, trust me, she is going to speak. Anyway, she arrives and she stands on this platform and I'm crouching below her. And she looks at me. She said, I'm going to speak. Where would you like me to stand? <laughs> Which I thought was wonderful. I just held the microphone up underneath her, out of sight of television cameras, and I looked at the PR man, and he was looking a bit sheepish. That was the first occasion. The second occasion, um, she actually asked me, I, I always went to Clarence House when I was working at Buckingham Palace on her birthday to manage the media. And every year, more and more cameras appeared, more television cameras, more reporters, more people, um, until eventually she was going up and down the road in a golf buggy. But on the one occasion, where, the only occasion when she turned 100, she had me called into Clarence House and she said, I, Dickie, I, I, I'd like a photograph with my people for a souvenir. It was wonderful the way she put it, with my people, uh, not my team, my people. Um, and I, I got hold of the Press Association photographer, briefed her uh, on what to do, and she took the photograph. The team were all lined up. And then the old lady got up, and remember, she's 100. Uh, she's not totally mobile. And she came over to me and she said, is that a digital camera? And I paused for a bit and I thought, here's this hundred year old lady born at the turn of the 20th century asking me if it's a digital camera. And I said, yes, ma'am, it is actually. He said, well, then can I see the picture? <laughs> so, so she knew exactly what was going on. She was a grand old lady um, and she did somehow rule the roost. Uh, she and uh, her daughter, late Queen Elizabeth II, spoke every morning. The switchboard famously uh, put through the phone call and saying, your majesty, her majesty is on the phone or vice versa. Um, so she was a formidable person and greatly missed when she did die in uh, March 2002. 
Do you know, so much of what you just said in describing her reminds me of your mother, my granny, queen in our world, who sadly is no longer with us. But there was something about that generation, the wartime generation and that inner steeliness. And uh, before we move on, there was just one other. Uh, it's a wonderful story about the queen mother that I always enjoyed. And I think it speaks to the personality that you're saying that when she was immobile, her daughter, the late queen, um, suggested that she have a, a golf buggy to move her around in personal space. And she was having none of it because she didn't want to be seen not being mobile. And uh, the queen had sent up a buggy, I think it was either to Castle of May or to Balmoral or somewhere, and it was promptly sent back the very next day. But then later the queen had it decorated with the queen mother's racing colors. And then she was more than happy to bomb around the palaces because suddenly it was her racing colors. But we're talking about this steeliness that is possessed by royal women. And I think we've seen it in spades with Queen Camilla. She married into the royal family relatively late in life. Uh, it's not something she came to naturally. And yet she too is of a generation where the show must go on. She's going to put her head down, talk about keep calm and carry on. She really has, um, she's driving what's happening behind the scenes in terms of the care for the king, but she's putting her best foot forward in front of the cameras as well. And really, I think that the example that speaks most to me is when the king learned of his diagnosis, we didn't discover it until the Monday after the weekend. So it was the day after World Cancer Day. She would have known about it when she went to Maggie's Cancer Center. Um, she knows well that these engagements are in the calendar weeks, usually months in advance. She knows there's usually a lick of paint that a team will have gone and wreckied. There's security to consider. There's the media to consider. More than that, though, there are the people that you are visiting that you don't want to let down. And she probably could have been forgiven for saying, I'll take a pass. I'm not sure I'm quite ready emotionally to go to a, a cancer center, having just learned that my husband has been diagnosed with cancer but she wouldn't have dreamed of saying no. And there she was. And you look at the photographs now in hindsight, now that we know she knew, it really speaks to how remarkable I think she is in terms of her support for the king, um, but her willingness to just put her best foot forward as well. And I know, obviously, you weren't at the palace when she and the king married, but you were there for the early days of their relationship. You were there for Operation Ritz, which the 25th anniversary of that was on January 28th. So I would love it if you could speak about her personally a little bit because she's still vilified in some quarters. I live in the US, there's still a Diana heavy fan club here, but I think we're really seeing the very best of Queen Camilla at the moment in terms of that keep calm and carry on approach. We are seeing the very best of Camilla, as you rightly say, keep calm and carry on approach. And it was a very famous quote from Prince Philip, late Prince Philip, just get on with it, uh, which is what she does. She and Prince Philip got on like a house on fire. She is a formidable woman. We've got to remember that she only came onto the royal scene in 2005 when she married the then Prince of Wales. Now, that is what, 19 years ago. Um, it's not a long time, but she has grown into the job. She has been on the, and always been on the edge of the, the, the British royal family. Her, her first husband was uh, commander of the household cavalry, uh, so he was very close. He was a godson to the late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. So there was always the connection. There was a connection at the Guards Polo Club because the king played polo with Andrew Parker Bowles. So there has always been a connection, but there's never been a connection with her going out on the road and doing royal jobs, being really the senior royal now doing the royal jobs. She was vilified for years by the British media, by the British public. Now, the Americans are not accepting her. They only accept really the person that they know. Diana had been in, in the States a few times. So yes, they accept it. Uh, they can't quite get their heads around Camilla, but she is a terrific person. I first met her, gosh, more than 40 years ago. Um, and she was always jolly. She was always a sense of humor. She was one of these people that when she talks to you, she looks you straight in the eye, a bit like late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, looks you straight in the eye, talks to you, gives you quality time, doesn't look over your shoulder to see who might be more important or more interesting or more handsome to talk to. She gives you quality time. And I was at a reception, oh gosh, about a year ago, and she was there. And we had a long chat. Um, it was actually the first time we talked since I first met her. And it was, it was like a reunion. 
Um, and it's it, it was common talk. It was all just like we're talking now. No airs and graces. There was no um, insisting on your royal highness or ma'am because I had known her before she was your royal highness and ma'am and now she's your majesty and ma'am. So a very straight person, a good person, a tower of strength for the king. Um, they get on terrifically well. They both have the same sense of humour. Um, in the early days when Charles was married to Diana, yes, he did call her darling in public. He called Camilla darling in public frequently. Uh, yes, Charles did sort of squeeze Diana's bottom in public and sort of put his hand on, on her arm. He does the same with Camilla. He is a little bit more tactile today than he used to be uh, all those years ago in the 1980s. But they are a good team, and there is no way, while the king is undergoing treatment and doing his constitutional role wherever he happens to be right now at Sandringham, um, she will not let him down, and she will do the work that is required of her. Uh, she's, she's going to a memorial service for King Constantine, who is a great friend, friend of, of, of Charles, um, and she will do the job and she will do it magnificently. And people do turn out. I've watched over the past few weeks. She's been in all sorts of towns in the, in the UK, in, in, uh, in, in Bristol and, and, and other places. And people do turn out. She does. She goes up and talks to them. And they're quite surprised when she does talk to them because she's talking to them like we are talking to each other now. Well, actually, I want to focus on these engagements because she really has been traveling the length and breadth of the country. She has her key areas of focus for her royal work. She lost both her, her mother and her grandmother to osteoporosis. So she has done so much to raise the profile of the Osteoporosis Society across the UK. Um, her work with uh, victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence has been incredible. She pioneered a program that gave ladies who had been through uh, the trauma of having to deal with rape kits special wash bags that would just uh, add a little humanity to the whole experience and just give them something nice to hold on to when they're going through so much trauma. There's so much work with animals. Her literacy work has been off the charts. What started as sort of a little book club during the pandemic has gone on to be tremendously successful. But Looking at just since the King's diagnosis, um, she did a centenary event for Queen Mary's Doll's House that was promoting literacy. Uh, there was a celebration of Shakespeare event. We know that the King is a diehard Shakespeare fan. He would have loved to have been there. She knew what it meant to him. So she went. Uh, there was a musical evening at Salisbury Cathedral. And I think what's striking here, bearing in mind she's 76 and by her own admission, she's a little doddery. Um, the helicopter had been grounded because of bad weather, but she didn't want to disappoint. So she drove six hours there and six hours back. Now, some people may watch this and roll their eyes and go, whoop de doo she got in a car and drove for six hours. But I think to her credit, she wasn't letting anybody down. And as we're saying, she was keeping the show on the road. Uh, there's been a hundred years of the poppy factory. She was made an honorary livery of liveryman of fan makers. And actually I thought what was quite nice at that event, she was supported by the Duchess of Gloucester. So we're seeing these royal women rally around. And what I'd like to do, because we are celebrating the ladies of the House of Windsor. And I think so often there's this suggestion that they're just a gaggle of shrinking violets and, and really they're just there to be mute and, and to look pretty. But when we look at them as a whole, Princess Anne was the first member of the royal family to compete in the Olympics um, in 2016. She, Princess Anne was at the Montreal Olympics in 76. In 2016, Sophie, uh, Duchess of Edinburgh, she completed a 445 mile bike ride from the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh to Buckingham Palace on behalf of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. She raised 180,000 pounds. That is a long bike ride. Um, Princess Eugenie, obviously not a working royal, but she was widely praised for choosing to wear a wedding dress that displayed her scoliosis scars, which gave people suffering from scoliosis something really to, to be proud of. At the same time at her wedding, Eugenie's wedding, her sister Princess Beatrice got up and read a flawless rendition of a passage from The Great Gatsby. She's dyslexic uh, and she has managed to make dyslexia a, a positive for so many sufferers. And then we look at Camilla and all the work that she has been doing, um, supported as well by the Princess of Wales, who is out of commission at the moment. But I think I do want to give the Princess of Wales a shout out. She's been largely credited for driving the mental health campaign of, of the foundation that she shared at one time with 
William and Harry. Um, her early years project continues to make significant strides, but it's almost at, on the home front where she's made the most dramatic difference because both she and William have said, the children come first and it's very different, uh, very difficult to go against the system. But I'd go so far as to say that she is helping to raise perhaps the most well-adjusted generation of royal children that the British monarchy will have ever seen. So we have a group of incredibly strong women here, and I would like to focus for a moment on Princess Anne. She is someone who doesn't like fuss. There is no ego. Talk about understanding the role of the job. Uh, we've previously talked about in other episodes how she has said that a slimmed down monarchy doesn't look very good from where I'm standing, and that's because she's already doing so much. But since her brother's diagnosis, she's been traveling the length and breadth of the country, sometimes over 100 miles a day to make sure she can get to every single stop. And I know you've always admired Princess Anne. She's someone who doesn't suffer fools, quite like her father, late Prince Philip, in that regard. But uh, in the same way that you sort of shared a little bit about Camilla, perhaps you could give us a bit more of a sense of who Princess Anne is behind palace walls. Well, Princess Anne, as you rightly say, sort of goes the length and breadth of the country. I might have said this before, but it's still worth repeating that um, when she's at Gatcombe over the weekend and she's driving back to London, uh, to Buckingham Palace, she will work her way down. The, the M4 is the link uh, motorway between London and Gatcombe Park, and she'll work her way down all that motorway. Uh, if you drive straight there and or straight back, it's about a three and a half hour drive, but that will take her all morning. She'll turn left, she'll turn right, she'll go off the motorway to do engagements. Sitting in a car is wasted time, and she, she doesn't do time wasting. She wants to work, and that is her culture. That's her dad's culture. She is her father's daughter, uh, and, and cynics used to say she was the best king we never had. Uh, but that's another story altogether. Um, there was a time when I was reporting and I went to interview her at Buckingham Palace and I'd heard what she was like and thought, well, well you know, I'll take my chance. And I was shown up to her study, um, which was a room facing the Mall. Uh, I was alone. There was no press office or anything like that. And I was left to kick my heels and in she walks. She'd obviously spent, and this is at half past four in the afternoon, so she's not finished work. She'd obviously had a sh been working all day. She probably had a shower, got herself you know, cleaned up and what have you. And in walks this person. Well, if I say that she were, her hair was down, normally it's up for, for engagements and for public uh, appearances. So the hair was down. She was wearing um, a jersey knit tight polo top, red, and brown cords. And I took one look and I thought to myself, wow. Then I cleared my throat and did the interview. You managed to pull yourself together. I pull myself together, yes. Yes, I'm yes. glad to hear that. But actually, Dad, you have a really funny story. This just so, it's such a perfect illustration of her personality. You have to share the story of when you saw her at Windsor Castle. I think, was it the golden wedding anniversary or it was the restoration of Windsor Castle? It was late Queen's golden wedding anniversary ball and uh, was it lucky enough to be invited. It was quite a, quite an event walking through St George's Hall and I spied five queens sitting together, which you wouldn't get anywhere in the world, quite frankly. There was the... Well, it depends what clubs you might be in, but that's yeah, another that's story. Funny. I mean, I, I was in an exclusive club. There was a queen of Denmark, the queen of Sweden, the queen of Norway, the queen of Spain uh, and the queen of Holland. Um, and, and there were still more queens in, in St George's Hall. But I was walking around and I went up right at the end of St George's Hall where the old private chapel used to be. They made that into the lantern lobby and it has a mezzanine floor. And I went up and there was Princess Anne regaling uh, a crowd of people about the restoration. And I just stood back and I listened to her and I thought, man, you're getting it wrong. And I just sort of looked and I just shook my head like this. And she took one look at me, smiled, said, OK, you do it. <laughs> so I was left um, telling everybody about uh, what the Lantern Lobby was all about and what had been there and where the fire had started and sort of try and point in the right direction. She was very good humoured about it. She, she's that sort of person. She, you, you don't muck around with her. But having said that, there is another little anecdote. When I first started at the palace, um, I was invited by the late Queen to um, uh, Balmoral 
for a diamond sleep. Diamond sleeps were usually 24, 36 hours. For some reason, I was up there 48 hours. And uh, I went to a picnic on the first day, and we talked about this in a previous edition. Um, but one evening, there was another, it wasn't a picnic, it was a sort of barbecue at a log cabin, which this one was down by the river, by the River Dee. Uh, and um, H HM, as was, uh, told me to go to the kitchen to get something. Well, he told me to, ask me to get get something. It wasn't an order. You will go to the kitchen and get something. And I went to the kitchen and there was Anne with her husband now, but then he was sort of husband to be, or they were boyfriend and girlfriend. They were in a clinch. And it took me aback a bit. And I took one step back and I looked. I said, goodness me, is this a private party or can anybody join in? <laughs> Which was a bit cheeky. Um, I shouldn't have gone there, but you know, I'm a maverick. I do these things. Well, and I'm sure you, you know, the, the royals do have a sense of humour. I mean, yes, there is a very careful line that you don't want to cross, but I suggest I would imagine they giggled. Yeah, they did giggle. I, I, I didn't get fired, so I must have. It must have been accepted. Yeah, it must have been accepted. Well, talking about the late Queen, there is perhaps no finer role model for the women that are working today than Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. At the time of her death, she was the longest reigning monarch in British history. She was the longest lived British monarch. She was the oldest serving sovereign in the world. And it's quite staggering as we look at the, the future of the monarchy. King Charles obviously in situ now, but then we have King William, then we have King George. So that really speaks to how important it is to have these strong women that are out conducting engagements, doing the job that is required of them and being role models for women in today's society. And I think it's very easy to be dismissive of royal women because as a politically neutral institution, they, they can't say too much about what they might think on a personal basis, but that doesn't diminish the work that they are doing. So so uh, as the King remains out of commission, certainly for the foreseeable future, I, for one, am really enjoying seeing the royal ladies out and about and being recognised for the work that they're doing as well. And I know that, Dad, you too, uh, you had admired the late Queen enormously. You've had a lot of strong women in your life as well. How do you think the King is regarding this? Obviously, I don't want you to put words in his mouth, but he has a history of working with strong women, uh, whether it's with his charity, uh, the Prince's Trust, uh, whether it's in his personal office as well. Do you think there's going to be a certain level of calm and comfort knowing that his wife, his sister are sort of holding down the fort as they are? There is a lot of calm. The monarchy is continuing. It's, it, because he's not out and about doesn't mean to say that the monarchy as an institution isn't functioning. It is functioning. It is working. He is having his, uh, his meetings with, uh, with the prime minister, albeit over the telephone. That's how the late queen did it uh, during the COVID lockdown over two years. There's no reason why the king can't do that. Uh, and that it, that's what he's doing from, from Sandringham. And there will be the face-to-face -face meetings should he happen to be at Buck and palace after a period of treatment but the monarchy is functioning and it is important to stress that that the affairs of state are being dealt with by the monarch he is doing his red boxes these are very important they are government documents that need to be initialed they need to be signed they need to be seen uh, and likewise with documents that are coming in from governors general at the at the realm states. And there are another 14 of them, 15 making it the United Kingdom. So, yes, the, 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 the institution of monarchy is functioning, although the king isn't out and about. And he's missing that. He's probably very frustrated about that. But he will make up for lost time once his treatment is over. And his wife will be taking care of him behind the scenes. Well, I know there's a lot of people that are looking out for the return of the Princess of Wales. I've taken it as an incredibly positive sign that she's recuperating well because we are seeing a little bit more of her husband, the Prince of Wales, out and about. Uh, we are going to be covering all of it in the coming weeks and months. So please do stay tuned to Royal Report. Make sure you subscribe, like, ring the bell. Uh, we look forward to bringing you all the latest royal news 
and some fun anecdotes from behind the scenes that have never been shared before. Please use the comment section below as well. We always enjoy hearing your thoughts on the topics that we are discussing. Please do subscribe. It's free to do so. And that way you can have the latest edition in your inbox as and when it's published. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time on Royal Report. Thank you.